All right, good morning, everybody, and thank you again for taking the time to join us today. I'm Mike Albertson. I'm the Deputy Director here at the Center for Global Security Research. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to welcome Michael Eisenstadt, who's the Khan Fellow and Director of the Military and Security Studies Program at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Um, his talk today is on deterring Iran in the gray zone, insights from 40 years of conflict. Um, he is a specialist in Arab-Israeli and Persian Gulf security affairs. He's published widely on irregular and conventional warfare and nuclear weapons proliferation in the Middle East. And his talk today um, is, in fact, sort of a summary of a recent piece he wrote. And you can find um, his impressive bio in the flyer for the talk that was sent around. Uh, you know, it's it's a great topic today because you in the audience kind of get a, a three for out of this, which is not unusual in a CGSR talk, but it always comes as sort of a welcome bonus, like like an in-trip award score in Scrabble. Um, I mean, one, we've been doing a fair amount of, of speakers on Iran recently, but those have been primarily focused on the Iran um, nuclear deal, the JCPOA. So I think this will be beneficial to, to the Iran watchers out there because you're going to get a more holistic look at, at Tehran's toolkit um, in the region. Um, two, we've done a lot of great work at uh, CGSR on the gray zone. I mean, this, this, is, this is Brad Roberts' publications on Red Theories of Victory. Um, these are workshops we've had over the years on regional deterrent strategies against adversaries who want to operate below the threshold of conventional conflict. Um, and there's a lot of great reports from those workshops on our website. So I think people who follow sort of Russia and China and, and the problems we face in those regions will get a chance to see, you know, some similarities, but also differences um, from their subject matter in this presentation on Iran. Um, and, and third, I mean, we're getting more and more engaged here at the lab on the topic of multi-domain deterrence. And there's no area where multi-domain comes more into play than, than here in the gray zone, right? Where you have lots of um, actions by adversaries, you have lots of US vulnerabilities, and you have a lot of different response options in the toolkit that are all being weighed as to their efficacy and, and whether they're proportionate or not. So sort of multi-domain comes in no, no more um, prevalently than, than here, I think, in the gray zone. So I think it'll be it'll be interesting as we think more about this topic of multi-domain deterrence. So, I mean, it's it's a great topic to be explored. You know, there's some big, thick, juicy questions to occupy the discussion time. You know, can deterrence exist in the gray zone? How do you balance compellence and deterrence in this part of the conflict spectrum? You know, what's the proper strategy for responding to deter future actions without sparking inadvertent escalation? You know, what are red lines for either side? Do do rules and norms even exist in this part of the spectrum? So I'm really excited that we'll get to explore this topic today with Michael and it's it's an excellent presentation and, and he'll he'll do it justice. So just a reminder on on protocol, Michael's gonna speak here for about 30 to 45 minutes. Um, his, his remarks will be recorded and likely be posted up on the CGSR website here in a few weeks. Um, when he's done with his remarks, we'll open up to questions and answers for the remainder of the program, and that content is going to be off the record and not for attribution. Um, you know, please submit your questions electronically to myself or Katie Thomas at any time during the presentation, or raise your hand electronically, and the earlier you get your hand up or get your questions in, the more likely I am to, to, to have you ready to go in the queue um, when, it, when it's your turn to ask your question or, or be recognized. So, Michael, thank you again for joining us, and over you for a great presentation. First of all, I have to admit that for a long time, I was a gray zone skeptic. Um, likewise, with regard to hybrid warfare and asymmetric warfare, simply because a lot of these terms are not used in a very um, disciplined way. Uh, and, 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 and I saw them kind of as buzzwords. But I decided about a year and a half ago to kind of revisit my um, you know, bias in that regard and um, to see if perhaps at least some of these terminologies could provide value added for my analysis. And I did, dug deeply into the literature and I found or I came to the conclusion that if you define them rigorously and define their relationship to each other, they actually provide a lot of value added. I'm not going to go into my full spiel about gray zone versus asymmetry versus hybrid warfare. I actually did uh, two pieces, one uh, a monograph at the Institute uh, that's on our website and another piece that was in PRISM um, magazine published by NDU just a few weeks ago in their March issue. If, if you want the short version of it, it's in, it's, it's in the PRISM article, I, I would recommend. But bottom line is, I, I, I really found that the whole gray zone kind of concept 
provides a lot of um, utility and allows me to take things to the, the next level. After doing those pieces, I kind of, you know, felt and, and watching how the U.S. responded to Iran's counter pressure campaign against America's maximum pressure campaign against Iran in 2019 and 2020, I also kind of came to the conclusion, although this is something that I, I felt for a long time and have written about on a limited basis in the past, that we've kind of, A, forgotten some of the lessons of deterrence that we learned during the Cold War, although of course a lot of the Cold War lessons are related to nuclear deterrence and not conventional deterrence. And of course, gray zone deterrence is a subset of conventional deterrence. And in many ways, I think is a very different animal than kind of traditional conventional deterrence. So anyhow, looking at how we were handling Iran's counter pressure campaign made me conclude that there was a need to write something about gray zone deterrence, because I felt that in many ways, we had not handled it um, in a very effective way. So the result is this study, perfect timing, Katie, thank you. The result was this study, um, you see the cover of it here, uh, deterring Iran in the gray zone, um, insights from four decades of conflict. Um, anyhow, next, next page, please. So let me just kind of give a little bit um, of background about, uh, you know, the gray zone in the Iranian context, okay? So first of all, let me just say that conventional warfare is not Iran's preferred way of war. Okay, gray zone activities are. They've been doing this since the early days of the revolution, from the embassy hostage crisis to um, you know the Marine barracks bombing um, in Beirut, which they did with what was eventually to become Hezbollah in October 1983, the kidnapping of Americans in Lebanon by Hezbollah with Iranian assistance, uh, Hobart Tower bombings in 96, all the stuff they did in the Gulf during the Iran-Iraq war operate during Operation Ernest Will. So anyhow, this is something which their gray zone strategy dates to the early days of the revolution, okay? So they don't see major conventional warfare as desirable. That's not their way of war. It's not desirable at all. And it's, and it's a legacy in part also, I think. I think there's a cultural element here that again, I, I, I have not been able to completely get my arm around. But it's also a result of the experience in the Iran-Iraq War. They call they refer to the Iran-Iraq War as the imposed war, because of course it was from their point of view imposed on them. It was as a result of an Iraqi invasion in 1980, um, and therefore, and it was it, it was a traumatic experience, eight bloody years of fighting, um, that still is an open scar on Iranian society. Many people from that generation today. Um, it was the defining feature of their life. Uh, many of the people are still suffering the wounds of that war, whether are conventional wounds or wounds from chemical warfare uh, waged by Iraq. So they never want to re repeat that experience again. Okay. Now they did fight and they are still fighting a conventional war in Syria. That also from their point of view was an imposed war. It was a war that, you know, um, Syria has long been Iran's only regional ally, only ally period, really, um, except for Hezbollah, which was kind of more a proxy ally. So, but it's the only state ally of, of, of Iran, who's a, a key, key partner in what they call their axis of resistance. And they saw the Syrian civil war as an attempt, this is their you know, public you know, kind of explanation. It was an attempt by the United States, world Zionism, you know, read Israel and the Saudis to you know, attack the weak link in the axis of resistance. So from their point of view, this is another imposed war. And circumstances were conducive to a more kind of conventional form of intervention there. I mean, their, their operations in Syria have been very much hybrid operations. We could discuss those later. But they've been operating overtly, not in the gray zone in Syria at all. And because, again, they can. There's no, there's no, um, the United States is not really involved there, at least, you know, in the fight that the regime um uh was fighting they had the the russians you know they 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 um convinced the russians to intervene on their side um in 2015. so it's a conducive environment to waging conventional warfare but again it was from their point of view an imposed war when they operate on their own terms they operate in the gray zone okay so again this is not a transitory calculation on their part of operating in the gray zone based on, you know, kind of momentary uh, calculation of what their interest is. It's a deeply rooted aspect of the strategic culture. 
Now, of course, Iran is not the only gray zone actor in the world. Um, and by the, in large, the gray zone op op modus operandi is preferred by anti-status quo actors like China, like Russia, as well as Iran, who realize that in, in their efforts to alter the status quo, they will come into contact and friction with other great, with, with great powers um, who could do them great harm. And so in order to advance their interests while avoiding escalation and war, they, they have this gray zone modus operandi. So, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more on that in a minute, my definition of, of, of gray zone, in, at least in the Iranian case. Also a key element in the success of the gray zone approach or modus operandi is that they're able to play on the adversary's fear of escalation and all out war. So the United States, you always often hear, and, and, and this is almost like a media narrative you hear now. After the killing of Qasem Soleimani, you know, the IRGC, the Iranian IRGC Quds Force commander, the US and Iran were on the brink of war. Well, I, we were on the brink of escalation. I don't think we were on the brink of war. Uh, but this is almost a narrative which the Iranians play on. And you hear Foreign Minister Zarif say all the time, steps the United States are taking, are pushing the region to the brink of all-out war. This thing about all-out war, whatever, whatever all-out war means, I have no idea. But it plays on this, you know, American traumas, which, you know, the Vietnam trauma, the Iraq trauma, more recently, the Iraq trauma, the trauma related to the American, the, the embassy hostage crisis with Iran in 79 and 80 and 81, and the, uh, the various hostage crises um, in Lebanon in the 90s. And even today, keep in mind, Iran has about half a dozen dual American Iranian citizens that it's holding hostage. So it kind of plays on these fears of escalation uh, you know, and you know, again, the, the American trauma of easy in, not so easy out in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, it also plays on this binary kind of way of thinking. The Americans have a binary approach toward this war and there's peace. And it's not just cultural, but it's, it's rooted in our legal system. And we have, you know, even in the constitution, you declare war when you go to war, even though I don't think, it's, I guess it's been World War II was the last time we did this. So we have this binary approach to war and peace. And there's this area in between the gray zone that Iran exploits because they have a view of conflict, which is a continuum. And from their point of view, they've been at war with us ever since the revolution in 79. They see us as the global hegemon that kept the Shah in power. And it's their goal is to overturn the regional balance of power in the Middle East. And of course, longer term, you know, the global balance of power, although that's kind of a, you know, unrealistic quest at this point. So let me just go into a little bit more detail about, you know, the, ele the, the, the elements of, of Iran's gray zone approach. First of all, incrementalism, um, salami tactics, testing and probing the adversary to determine its response thresholds. That's one element. Reliance on proxy or unacknowledged activities. So you could act through proxies and Iran is a master of using proxies. First Hezbollah in the, in the, in the starting in the eighties. And then they've created in Iraq various proxies since the early 80s to use against Saddam Hussein and then against the United States after the United States invaded in 2003. More recently in Syria, they've tried to create mini Hezbollahs among the, this very tiny Shiite community in Syria. And the Houthis, which are, the Houthis are not really a proxy, although I, I think they occupy, they occupy a gray zone between independent actor and proxy. And it's very hard. I, I don't follow the Houthis very closely, I have to say. So, but my colleagues who do say within the Houthis, there are those who differ on their attitude towards Iran, whether they, and, and there are some who clearly see themselves as a proxy of Iran and, and, and welcome that role and others who don't. So it's, it's really hard to say where the Houthis fit, but the bottom line is Iran relies heavily on proxies or partners who sometimes act as proxies, but they also engage in unilateral, unacknowledged unilateral activities sometimes. So that's again, the cent and again, that provides them standoff a degree of um, uh, deniability, okay? And then the avoidance of decisive engagement with the enemy, and this is important. I think, again, that's why you rely on proxies or unacknowledged activities, and you engage on, in, uh, you rely on standoff. Because once you get decisively engaged um, in, in, in kind of mid or high intensity con conflict, it's very hard to disengage. Um, and this gets into the point I make here about pacing and spacing activities. This is really a very important part of Iran's operational art when it comes to gray zone activities. Pacing and spacing. 
if you look back decades ago, Iran's activities, activities against the United States, very often they were like once every few years. Okay, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a constant, um, it wasn't a high op tempo, their, their, their long-term competition against the U.S. And then their counter-pressure campaign, once it really kicked off in May of 2019, even then it was kind of actions every few weeks or, you know, um, yeah, every few weeks that they would do something. It wasn't a flurry of activities which would then, you know, cause the U.S. to react or overreact. So, again, the pacing is a way of preventing the adversary from overreacting. And also geo, geo, geographically spacing your activities is another way of um, avoiding adversary overreaction, which again, keeps the conflict um, at the threshold below you know, war. Um, and there's always the, the hope that if you space things long enough, the adversary, you know, you, you're playing, and I don't know how much they really actually think about this, although I think, post facto, it works out this way at the very least, that, you know, if the Iranians do something and they don't do something for another six or eight, eight weeks, you're, you hope maybe you're out, of the, you're out of the woods with them and they won't do something, any, you know, anything anymore. And if we don't respond, maybe things will be good. So by spacing your activities, excuse me, pacing your activities this way, you feed hopes on the part of the adversary, or at least on the part of those decision makers among the adversary, in the adversary's camp, we don't want to escalate that, you know, if we, if we don't respond, they won't respond again. And, and maybe we could de-escalate. Maybe this is the off ramp. So, um, but, but the one thing that really came to me when doing this deterrence study that the whole, really essence of the gray zone approach is to, it's designed to circumvent or defeat the adversary's deterrence efforts. Really that's what gray zone, the gray zone's about. It's a way of circumventing adversary red lines or watering them down. Um, and managing risk is central to this effort. And just remember those terms, um, managing risk, because this is key to kind of um, developing an effective counter to an adversary's gray zone approach. Uh, because risk management is central. And if you can, this is a vulnerability or this is um, a feature that you, you that you should exploit when trying to deter a gray zone actor. And just my final point here is that Iran has a pretty well-worn gray zone playbook like that they've been using since the 90s. Again, a lot of the um, a lot of their toolkit, you know, kidnappings, embassy invasions, um, small boat operations, um, harassment of uh, maritime traffic they've been doing for decades. Okay. So there's a lot of continuity. But they're constantly adding new things, um, new tweaks. So, for instance, their development of long-range precision strike capabilities in terms of drones, cruise missiles, highly accurate ballistic missiles is a new feature. They've always had they've had missiles since the 80s, but highly accurate capabilities in this area is very new. Um, gives them new, you know, more more options in this regard. And cyber also provides uh, more options. So please remind me if I don't talk about cyber and cross domain deterrence lessons later on, please do ask it during the Q&A because I'd like to discuss this more. Next, play, next page, please. Okay, so let me just make, these are a few of the insights from watching Iran for four decades. You know, okay, first of all, you know, this is kind of conventional. There are learning adaptive adversary, but let me give you a few examples of what I mean. So the, 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 the main example I want to give you is from the maximum pressure campaign, May 2019, okay? So they started with um, from simple to complex operations and from non-lethal to lethal activities. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. The first attack in the maritime domain was the limpet mining of ships at anchor off of Fujairah in the United Arab Emirates. So very simple, ships were at anchor, they weren't moving. And I think four of them were hit by limpet mines, probably placed by combat swimmers. Then several weeks later, they did an attack at sea on ships underway in the Gulf of Oman, okay? So the ships were moving. They probably approached it with a small boat and the small boat came uh, on side and they put the magnetic limpet mines on, 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 on the, above the waterline of the ship. And um, again, a little more complex because the ships were underway. 
Likewise, with regard to their cruise missile and, and, and ballistic missile, uh, their drone and cruise missile strikes. The first one was in May. It was an attack on the east-west oil pipeline in Saudi Arabia. It, was, it came out of southern Iraq, probably was done by Qatar Hezbollah, one of Iran's foremost proxies, but claimed by the Houthis, interestingly. The Houthis took credit, although it came from Iraq and it was done by Qatar Hezbollah. But that was a very simple, that was just, a, I think, if, if I remember, it was a drone strike against two pumping stations in the oil pipeline, okay? So it was from a single point using one type of weapon against two fixed positions. Then in September of 2019, they relied on cruise missile, uh, both drones and cruise missiles from multiple locations, it seems, from southwestern Iran, as well as perhaps from Iraq, um, against two different sites. Um, so again, a little more complex. Likewise, you know, the, the limpid minings were, and, and the attack on, on Abqaiq and El Khores in Saudi Arabia were non-lethal attacks. Likewise, when Iran started ramping up the rocket attacks against American, you know, personnel in Iraq, these were all harassment attacks, not, probably not intended to kill. But they eventually started, you know, increasing the number of rockets used, uh, the size of the rockets used, and finally, in December of 2019, they killed an American. Okay, so they they again they graduate, you know, testing to see what they could get away with, learning from their pre uh, their previous activities, increasingly sophisticated. As I mentioned before, for Iran, managing risk is paramount, but risk averse, and and I think a lot of their activities dis display this what I call risk aversion. The fact that they're risk averse does not mean they're risk avoidant. Okay, they just calibrate risk and they try to minimize it whenever possible. So I, I, again, the reliance on proxies or you know, covert or unacknowledged attacks on their part is uh, evidence of this, but they will act overtly if need be. So for instance, after the killing of Qasem Soleimani, they, re re they re retaliated overtly with a missile attack on Al-Assad Air Base. 100, more than 100 Americans got traumatic brain injuries, but again, it was non-lethal, although I think they were willing. I think the goal was maybe to kill some Americans, okay? But they let the Iraqis know several hours before the attack that it was coming. And they probably knew that the Iraqis were gonna tell the Americans. So that gave us time. We also had apparently indications and warning. This is from all from open sources, by the way. This is unclassified. So everything I say is based on open sources. So we had apparently early warnings. We saw the missiles being readied for launch, but the Iraqis also told us that the attack was coming. So it gave us time for our, our personnel to take shelter. Um, which probably also limited the potential for harm. So again, I think the Iranians did it in a way to, you know, they, they were willing to kill Americans if, if need be, but they took measures to limit the potential harm, okay, um, you know, by giving the Iraqis advanced warning. warning. Okay. So um, we could talk a little bit about more that a little bit more uh, a bit later on. About gray zone deterrence being complex and challenging. OK, a lot of times when we've been trying to deter Iran, not just during the maximum you know, policy of maximum pressure, but during the Iran Iraq war and the like, we're also engaged in efforts to compel Iran. OK, so these so you have actually more than deterrence going on at the same at, at, at a time you're trying to compel. So in the case of maximum pressure, we were trying to compel Iran to come back to the negotiating table to renegotiate the new nuclear deal and to fold in, um, you know, a kind of additional agreements on Iran's regional activities, their missile program, human rights, and, 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 and support for proxies and stuff like that. The problem is sometimes your efforts to compel may work at cross purposes to your efforts to deter without really understanding that. And I think that's what happened. I don't think we really realized this, that, you know, are, you know, so what, what, what happened is this. Now, let, and, and let me just give a little bit of a backstory here. I supported in principle the idea of a nuclear deal with Iran in 2015. I, I thought the particular deal that we got, the JCPOA was, was very problematic from my point of view. I think the Obama administration did a very good job at setting the table for the negotiations, but I think they really squandered a lot of our, our leverage. And as a result, I think we got a less than optimal deal. 
So, but that said, I was against the Trump administration withdrawing from the deal at the time, because I thought the timing was, was, was the, not the right time. Because again, I thought, you know, again, down the road, 10 or 12 years down the road, once Iran, if Iran did not change and started to ramp up its nuclear program um, and to, to build a civilian nuclear program, an industrial scale civilian nuclear program, as they were permitted under the JCPOA, without any change in their regional policies, that was the time then to leave the deal. So I was against the Trump administration leaving the deal when they did. It also created a lot of problems with our allies. That said, after about eight months of us being out of the deal, I, I kind of came to the conclusion that actually in some ways we were in the best of all worlds, that Iran was still adhering to the nuclear caps of the JCPOA, and we were reimposing nuclear sanctions on Iran and imposing a significant cost on the economy there. And perhaps to some extent, you know, limiting their ability to build up, you know, their, their military, you know, and, and um, perhaps, you know, creating some instability at home, which forces them to focus more, you know, on their internal situation, maybe, maybe not, we could talk about that. Um, so I wasn't actually, I thought we were in a good place in April of 2019. But the administration decided at that time they were still in the, they still were, they still had, um, they were allowing eight countries to purchase Iranian oil at the time because we didn't want to completely take Iranian oil off the market because that would have caused a spike in oil prices and would have hurt our economy and the economy of our allies. But by April of 2019, we came to the conclusion that we could end those waivers, try to drive Iranian oil to zero, and um, really turn, turn the, um, um, the thumb screws on Iran in order to put pressure on them to come to the negotiating table. That was, I think, a mistake, okay? And that was a bit of overreach. So what we did, we ramped up our compellence efforts in May, April, May of 2019, and effectively pushed Iran in a corner where they said, okay, U.S. is trying to cut our oil exports to zero. Um, they're really going for regime change at this point. We, we have to strike, we have to lash out militarily in order to cause them to back off. So our compellence efforts in the end undermined our deterrence efforts. And even sending carrier strike groups to the region, threats don't do anything or, you know, or, or will hit you back hard, it didn't make a difference in the end because we had pushed them into a corner and they felt they had nothing to lose because of our compellence policy. And therefore we, our compellence under, undermined deterrence. Um, so that's one lesson and I'll discuss that a little bit more um, in a moment. Plus also there's the whole issue of um, asymmetries and motivation, okay? Which poses challenges. We are a global power. We have global commitments. We can't always focus on Iran and we can't respond to every provocation or challenge from Iran because we have to worry about the North Koreans and the Chinese and the Russians. So that gives Iran a certain latitude to act, a certain freedom of action because they know we can't always respond to everything. You know, our, our, you know, we're, we're trying to rebalance to the Indo-Pacific region and responding to every provocation works against that. So that, that inherently will give them certain, you know, latitude to act. Um, and that's just a fact of the matter. We'll discuss that a little bit more in a moment. Another thing is that deterrence effects are often short-lived. Americans often think about deterrence as a state, a state of being, and that you sometimes have to use force to restore deterrence. And I actually like General McKenzie, the, the, the commander of CENTCOM's kind of, you know, formulation of contested deterrence. It is never a state. It's always being contested. It's always being challenged by the adversary, at least by a motivated adversary like Iran. And especially when you're in, when you're in it, you know, like, uh, you know, during the American maximum pressure and the Iranian counter pressure campaign, when you're in this ongoing dynamic, deterrence is a dynamic process. It's not a state. And therefore, it's a, it's a mistake to, to think of it in that way. And when, you know, Secretary of State Pompeo talked about our attack, the, excuse me, the, the targeted killing of, um, you know, Qasem Soleimani, he said, we did this to restore deterrence. And I think that's just the wrong way of thinking about it, because you don't restore deterrence. It's not a state that you're trying to restore. And, and, and the aftermath of the killing of Soleimani was the best example of that, because in five days later, Iran retaliated. And for the remaining three weeks in January or so after the killing of Soleimani, almost constant rockets on American bases and American, the American embassy. Um, although, although it did, you know, certainly Iran was affected 
their cost benefit and risk calculus was affected by the killing of Soleimani, and they were very cautious and tentative in dealing with the United States thereafter. But it, you know, they will always test and probe to see what your response threshold is. Even after the killing of Qasem Soleimani, they did that. And during the summer, they started ramping up attacks again. Okay, after a period of quiet to, to kind of you know take our measure and see what our you know kind of mindset was. So you you know deterrence is is you know deterrence effects are generally short lived. Um, even hitting the the adversary really hard, it buys you maybe a little bit of time. And again, you know he or she will respond immediately. So and after the response, maybe they'll settle down for a bit, but then they'll challenge you again. So. Um, Conceptual asymmetries. I, I mentioned that a little before. We have a binary approach to war and peace. Iran has this, they see uh, you know, conflict as a continuum. Um, enough said there. Okay, the potential for war is greatly overstated. I, again, I mentioned this before about you know, the US and Iran are on the brink. You see that? Just, just, just Google Iran and on the brink and the US, and you'll find many, many stories that use this. I call it a meme because I don't think it's an analytical, analytical construct. And when I've written several journalists to use this term, you know, and I say, please, what is your evidence that we were on? The, first of all, what is the brink of war? Where, where is the brink? You know, in the gray zone, there is no brink, <laughs> you know, because everything is gray. But, but, but you know, the whole dynamic is, you know, of, of gray zone conflicts of, you know, periods of escalation followed by period, longer, much longer periods of de-escalation and quiet. So, so and they could, when I said, what is your evidence that we were on the brink? They, they never have any evidence. And, and again, we were on the brink of further escalation, yes. But all that war, I don't even know what all that war means in the context of two countries. You know, if you're not invading, what does all that war mean? Um, you know, you can have prolonged gray zone campaigns or prolonged, you know, shadow wars like we had in the 90s with the Iranians. And that's traumatic enough. But, you know, when you use the term all that war, it just, it's, it's the wrong mental model. It's the wrong, you know, kind of... Um, prism um, or framing kind of terms, you know, to, to look at, you know, these kind of long-term competitions that are, you know, where advantage is obtained through incremental um, action rather than decisive action, okay? And that's also part of the problem with our, you know, our mind, you know, kind of our, our mindset. We're still heavily influenced by this kind of conventional war, war model which is influenced by this, you know, Klosevitzian concept of decisive battle. So we talk about, you know, we used to talk about decisive operations. We now talk about dominate, in, you know, phase three, which I still think is very problematic because we rarely are in a situation with our adversaries that we completely dominate. It's a contested kind of, you know, kind of, um, you know, situation. So a lot of our mental models are completely inadequate to, you know, the gray zone activity. I, I go into more about this in my in the study. Please read it if, if this interests you. But a lot of the problems that we face in dealing with adversaries like Iran is that, again, our, our mental models are wrong, our vocabulary is wrong. So for instance, we talk about, you know, Americans always talk about decisive action. And in gray zone activities, it's very rarely decisive action. Even the killing of Soleimani, you know, it had a psychological impact on Iran, but it didn't stop them from doing what they do. They just, you know, paced and spaced their operations differently. They, you know, um, were more careful with the testing and probing of us, gave us a little bit of breathing space maybe, but it, it, you know, there's no decisive, you know, action, okay? Um, likewise, you know, go big or go home doesn't work with gray zone activities. You're in, the, you're in a long-term you know, competition. So uh, long-term strategic competition. So you have to pace yourself um, also, for reasons related to our domestic politics, gray zone activities, if we were to adopt a gray zone approach, which is, which is what I advocate at the end, it's much less disruptive domestically as well as our, in terms of our relationship with our allies and partners, such as the Iraqis or the Europeans. So go big and go home doesn't work. Tell me how this ends doesn't work because it may never end. When I say never, it never is a long time, but I mean, in terms of you know the political cycle in the US, these kind of, this is part of a long-term strategic competition that might last for decades, okay? And likewise, what's our exit strategy? Well, there is no exit strategy because we're not in. You know, we're, we're the way we, that we engage in the gray zone um, doesn't mean necessarily boots on the ground. It means kind of limited use of force. And um, again, there's no exit strategy that's, you know, don't, I don't know how it ends because 
Nobody can tell you how it ends, but we're managing our level of involvement so that it's sustainable politically and militarily. And it enables us still to do our rebalancing to the Indo-Pacific because these kind of operations, at least with Iran, are low op, low op tempo, low resource um, operations. And I'll, I'll get a little bit to, you know, you know, sending carrier stri uh, strike groups as a way of deterring Iran. I, I have, uh, this is another one of my hot buttons. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so anyhow, next slide. And this is, I think the next slide is the last slide, which are the implications for kind of, you know, what are the, you know, what are the elements of a more effective gray zone, you know, deterrent strategy for Iran? So first of all, let me just say, um, you know, I, I, I've been already talking here about how we need to re reassess how we think, organize, and act, because our traditional mode of thinking and acting and organizing is not um, suitable for this kind of conflict, okay? So I, my, my first argument is, you know, fight far with fire, not, not because, you know, it, it's poetic, but because I think it's a more effective means of dealing with the challenge and the, and, 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 and the, um, the adversary. And for all the other reasons I mentioned before, it's less disruptive it, 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 to our domestic politics. It doesn't roil our domestic politics the way that overt, heavy actions do with all the kind of concerns about forever wars in the Middle East, where you know the administration is bringing this to the brink of another forever war. You know, if you operate in the gray zone, you don't take credit for activities. You operate, you know, covertly. Um, who knows? Who knows what what's going on? For instance, I'll give you a good example of this. Twice in 2019, oil pipelines off the coast of Syria were sabotaged, okay? Now, we only found out recently who this was, but for a long time, it wasn't clear whether this was the United States, Turkey, Israel, or rebels, okay? Now, the pipelines were used to offload Iranian oil that was shipped to Syria, that was used to you know, fuel Syria's um, war effort against the rebels, and a lot of, and some of the money was diverted to Hezbollah. Um, but the point is, nobody even heard about it in the American media. The, the, the Syrians publicized it, but they, they didn't blame anybody, because I don't think they really knew who, who did it. Recently, it came out that it was probably the Israelis. It was part of their ongoing gray zone um, conflict with Iran that they've been waging since 2017. Oh, and, and, and that's another good example of how you can wage gray zone conflicts for years and even kill your adversary and not get not not find yourself at war or in a quagmire. So the Israelis have this long this you know and then we can talk about this during the Q and A because I don't want to discuss it right now. But the Israelis have been waging a gray zone com, you know conflict against Iran in Syria for the, for you know more than three years now. Killed at least you know eight Iranians by at least Iranian admission maybe more. And yet again, it hasn't led to a war. It has led to some escalation um, and some disconcerting kind of developments. But, you know, again, and let me just also say, you know, this gets back to my point before about um, on the brink of war, the US and Iran have been waging, you know, on and off kind of this kind of, you know, war in the shadows, this kind of struggle for 40 years, Iran acting more in the gray zone than we have, although we have operated in the gray zone occasionally against Iran, mostly in the cyber domain. Um, but we haven't gone to war as a result. So I, I think, again, you know, the concerns that, you know, these kind of gray zone activities could lead to war are overstated. I'm, I would never dismiss it. I would never say it's not possible. But by and large, again, both parties have, you know, kind of figured out how to operate um, against each other without escalating to war. So, okay, so I'm, I'm arguing that we need a gray zone deterrent strategy against Iran, okay? We need to, again, I, I, I've already, touch on some of these points. So I'm not gonna, you know, um, belabor them at this point um, about, you know, changing our conventional war mindset that deterrence is contested. Oh, and so what that what does that mean in this case? How do you measure deterrence, deterrence success against gray zone actors like Iran? It's not absolute. You're never gonna be absolute. You're never gonna be able to stop the adversary from doing everything that you don't want him to do. But you can deter him from, engaging in the most destabilizing activities and force them to operate by less destabilizing means. So I'll give, an ex I'll give you several examples, okay? First of all, the Marine barracks bombing in 1983 shows what Iran can do. Um, you know, it, you know, 241 Marines 
Um, Navy corpsmen and, and soldiers were killed there. Um, Hobart Towers, another example, 1996, 19 U.S. airmen were killed there. So they could do this, although I, I think some of their capabilities have atrophied since then, but they could do that. They've chosen not to do it, at least so far, okay? So all their activities in dealing with the Trump administration's counter-pressure campaign were, um, by and large, most of them were non-lethal. Some of them were lethal, but most were non-lethal, um, even though they have the ability to, you know, wage, you know, engage in lethal activities. So in a way, that's a partial deterrent success. We forced them to operate at the lower end of the conflict spectrum, using limited, you know, use of force in ways that are intended to be non-lethal and to impose financial costs to have psychological effect, but not to kill Americans. So that's a partial success. But you know, a little bit the non-success side I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. Okay. Um, and then exploit Tehran's preoccupation with managing risk. I'll, I'll give you examples right now. Okay. So I'm talking here about the need to align the ways, means, and ends of US deterrence strategy in the middle. So first I make the point about deterrence and compellence. You have to understand that you're often trying to do more things than uh, than deter at once. So you have to be aware of how your efforts to compel might undermine your your attempts to to deter. And I gave you the example before of you know our efforts to bring oil exports down to zero. My preference would have been allow Iran to continue to sell oil. Maybe not. You know, in in April of 2019, when they had we had the waivers on eight countries that were allowing Iran to buy oil. I think their exports were about 800,000 or a million barrels a day a day at that point. So they were basically, they were on life support. They were, their export, oil exports were greatly reduced, um, which were ha was having an impact on the economy, but not enough that they were willing to, to resort to force. So the challenge in the future is to figure out what's the sweet spot of where your compellence efforts, you know, achieve maximum effects with, without undermining deterrence. Again, there's no, there's no good solution to this. There's no right answer, but you just need to be aware of that your, your de compellence and deterrence efforts might be working at cross purposes. Okay, denial and punishment. The US has generally preferred to deter by denial with Iran because it was seen as less, es less escalatory. So we would say to Iran, you could shoot missiles or rockets at us, but we got missile and rocket defenses and we, and we, will, we will thwart whatever you're trying to accomplish by doing that. You could lay mines in the Persian Gulf, but we have minesweepers. So we have the ability to thwart whatever you're trying to accomplish that way. And that, that, that was our preference. But the problem is deterring by denial allows the adversary to calculate their risk. And they could say, you know, okay, you know, even if they hit our mine laying ships, we're willing to lose mine laying ships, okay? Even if they are, you know, destroy our, if we, we shoot some rockets or missiles at them, they'll shoot them down. Okay, we're willing to take that loss because some rockets or missiles might get through. Okay. So it enables the adversary to manage risk if you just rely on denial. If you also add punishment to the calcul to the to the to the um, equation, it makes the risk assessment much more difficult because first of all, they're gonna lose things, you know, because you're you're not just you know, acting, you know, at, um, you're not acting to shoot down the missiles or sweep their mines, but you're actually actively trying to destroy certain assets of them. But if you do that predictably, it still allows them to engage, you know, in risk management. So for instance, you know, we were originally thinking about after we lost the Global Hawk drone in, I think it was June of 2019, we were going to hit the surface to air missile site that shot them down. Okay. And that then, by doing the things that way, and that's generally how Americans act. We, because of the law of armed conflict, because we always are focused on discrimination, military necessity, and um, proportionality, we're very predictable in how we act. I think we could still be within the law of armed conflict, but be unpredictable. So we don't have to just hit the surface their missile site that shot down our drone. We could hit other sites that are actually much more important to the Iranians and impose a cost, not necessarily in lives, but in, in a material cost in terms of capabilities on them, which makes us much more unpredictable adversary and strengthens deterrence. At least that's my belief. And let me just say, since strategy is a learning process, all of these things have to be you know, tested you know, against reality. 
because you don't know how the adversary will react. But again, we, we tend to be very predictable in, in re responding in a, in a tit for tat way, which is very predictable. We need to be more unpredictable, okay? Um, capability and credibility. Whenever there's a threat from Iran, we send a carrier strike group to the Gulf. But I got a whole list of Iranian actions that were done when we had carrier strike groups in the Gulf. And it doesn't deter because never once have we launched a strike against Iran from a carrier strike group, except during the op Operation Earnest Will in 1987-88. But we never have once responded to an Iranian act of terrorism or a provocation or malign activity with an airstrike from a carrier in the Gulf or in the area, in the region. So we could, we could stack, rack and stack carriers high and deep in the Gulf and it doesn't have any impact on the Iranians because we never used a, a carrier to strike Iran. So our capability is not so much important as our credibility and the knowledge that we will act. And I would argue we could actually successfully deter or effectively deter with a much lower presence if we use that smaller presence much more assertively and actively in the gray zone, um, um, imposing costs on them that they are not willing to sustain rather than sending carriers that are simply conducting presence patrols, which, can be, which the Iranians routinely ignore. Okay. So this gets to responding consistently and acting unpredictably. Okay. I mentioned before that we often you know about, about the need for consistency in response. You, that doesn't mean responding to every provocation, because I said before, as a great power, we can't respond to everything. But you know, when the Iranians started shooting rockets against our troops in Iraq, in 2019, as they started ramping up their counter pressure campaign, for seven months, we did not respond to any of their activities in Iraq. And they finally ramped up to the point that they killed an American, which then led to an escalation. We killed 25 Qatab Hezbollah guys. They had protests by the US embassy. We had fears of the embassy being you know, stormed, like you know, uh, you know, 1979 and, and Benghazi, Libya in 2012. Keep in mind, Mike, Mike Pompeo, who was Secretary of State at the time, led the charge against Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State, criticizing her for the failure to protect the embassy. And that led us to you know, escalate further and kill you know, Qasem Soleimani. I, well, in the end, I think that was, it turned out to be a kind of um, very important, successful um, move on our part. I would have preferred still, even with, in retrospect, to not to have to avoid an escalation to that point. And perhaps if we had responded to, to harassing rocket fire with harassing fire of our own against Qatar Hezbollah, and maybe the Iranians as well, we maybe not would have never gotten to that point where an American would have gotten killed. So we got to be more consistent in our responses, because if you don't respond, you risk the, the enemy being emboldened and getting to the point that you're trying to avoid anyhow of further escalation. And likewise, I get, you know, there's a point I make here about being, you know, acting unpredictably. I, I, I made this point already, so I'm not gonna repeat it. But again, if, you're, if you are predictable in how you respond, you make it easier for the adversary to manage risk and therefore you weaken your ability to deter. And I'm gonna close this up in a, in a moment or two, but um, I just wanna make a few of the other points here about restraint and audacity. There are times to be audacious. So the killing of Soleimani, even though I opposed it at the time, was I thought it was unnecessarily escalatory. In the end, I think it worked out well. And again, this is what, like I said, you never really know what's going to happen or how your adversary is going to respond because strategy is a learning process. So you learn, as the Israelis often say, they learn through friction with their adversaries. This is something which, you know, again, through inter inter you know, interacting with your adversaries, watching how they respond, understanding what impact you've had on them, you learn. So there are times to be audacious, but after we killed Soleimani, rem remember, Iran responded with a retaliatory strike, didn't kill any Americans, although there were 100, you know, more than 100 troops with traumatic brain injuries. But afterwards, we signaled our desire to de-escalate. De the Iranians signaled their de desire to de-escalate, and we didn't respond. We acted with res restraint, and we were able to de-escalate the situation. So again, there are time, there's time for audacity, and there's time for restraint. When is which? Again, that gets to the whole issue. You know, I don't know if any of you have read Isaiah Berlin's um, article about political judgment. There's also a, an argument to be made about strategic judgment. It's an intangible. It's based on experience, learning, interacting with the adversary, and, and having this finger feel. 
for what will work and what won't work, okay? Maybe artificial intelligence will help us in the future with this. But right now, it, it's, it's more an intangible. There's, there's, no, there's no clear answers on this here, okay? So um, basically, and I guess the last point I want to make, I'm not going to go into the go long, not, you know, not big. This is kind of part of gray zone operational art, which I talked about before, about pacing and spacing, um, you know, that it's more important to achieve advantage through incremental gains rather than through a decisive, you know, spectacular action such as the killing of Soleimani, although that, that might help sometimes. But most of your, most of your gains are, are, are through incremental action, not by going big, but by going long and achieving cumulative effects on the adversary. And then finally, the final point I want to make is about communicating with Tehran. Um, there are times to be unpredictable and not to communicate what your intentions are because that increase, increases uncertainty and makes it harder for the adversary to manage risk. But there are also times to communicate to set expectations and clarify intentions, just as we did after killing Soleimani when we wanted to de-escalate. We in indicated our intention to de-escalate. Iran did as well, both by tweets as well as th through back channels through the Swiss embassy channel that we have with the Iranians, and we were able to de-escalate. Oh, let me make one more point before wrapping this up um, about cross-domain uh, deterrence. Um, we, I mentioned before that after the shoot down of the drone, of the, the Global Hawk drone um, in June of 2019, we were considering striking back at the surface air missile site that shut down, shut down, the, shot down the drone. And the president decided not to, he claims because there was a risk of casualties. I'm not sure that was completely true, but we decided to act by cyber means. And we, I think my understanding is based on, again, open sources, there was a cyber attack against the database that the Iranians used um, to follow maritime traffic in the Gulf and which helped them with the, the limpet mine attacks that preceded the shoot down of the drone. So the problem is I'm all for operating in, the, in, in, in cyber domain when necessary, but the question is by operating in the cyber domain in response to a, an attack in the physical domain, do you telegraph reluctance to act in the physical domain? And therefore, do you undermine your ability to dare in the physical domain by acting in the cyber domain? It's an open question. I leave it, I, I, and it's, it's something which, again, something we have to think about because often cyber is seen as an easy response to uh, an, uh, an activity in the physical domain, but there's a risk that you, you, you telegraph reticence to, to act in the physical domain when you act in the cyber domain, unless you're inflicting really you know, significant costs by doing so. So it's, it's, again, these are part of, you know, this is how this has played out, this cross-domain dim dimension that played out with US and Iran in the last few years. I'll leave it at that, and I look forward to our discussion.